this little disc. Um, Alright, so I think we typically start uh, by chanting Jaya Radha Madhava, and um, this is what we'll do. No, no, we are, we are, <laughs> I assure you. Um, we're reading from chapter 53, uh, verse 7 to, to 17. Um, I was asked to mention how I became involved in, Gosh, I can't even hear you from here. in, in Krishna consciousness. <laughs> Ask him if they can hear you. Um, Adi Purusha Puru asks if... Yes, can hear you, thank you. For okay, it sounds like... People can hear. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I became involved in um, in Soho Street in 2002. This is, and um, yeah, uh, that's <laughs> that's basically it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, verse um, verse seven. So this is uh, quite a few verses that we're going to cover. Um, and they have very short uh, purports. So let's take them one by one. Rajasa kundina pati putrasneha vashanugaha shishupalaya swam kanyam dashyam karmanya akarayat King Bhishmaka, the master of kundina, having succumbed in the sway of affection for his son, was about to give his daughter to Shishupala. The king saw to all the required preparations. I'll skip the Sanskrit for the next verses. The king had the main avenues, commercial roads and intersections thoroughly cleaned and then sprinkled with water. And he also had the city decorated with triumphant 
archways and multicolored banners on poles. The men and women of the city arrayed in spotless raiment and anointed with fragrant sandalwood paste wore precious necklaces, flower garlands and jeweled ornaments and their opulent homes were filled with the aroma of a guru. Mm -hmm. O king, in accordance with prescribed rituals, Maharaj Bhishmaka worshipped the forefathers, demigods and brahmanas, feeding them all properly. Then he had the traditional mantras chanted for the well-being of the bride. The bride cleaned her teeth and bathed, after which she put on the auspicious wedding necklace. And then she was dressed in brand new upper and lower garments and adorned with most excellent jeweled ornaments. The best of Brahmanas chanted mantras of the Rig, Sama and Yajur Vedas for the bride's protection. And the priest learned in the Atarva Veda offered oblations to pacify the controlling planets. Outstanding in his knowledge of regulative principles, the king rewarded the Brahmanas with gold, silver, clothing, cows, and sesame seeds mixed with raw sugar. Raja Damagosha, Lord of Chedi, so this is, of course, Shishupal's father, had also engaged Brahmanas expert in chanting mantras to perform all rituals necessary to ensure his son's prosperity. King Damagosha traveled to Kundina, accompanied by armies of elephants exuding Mada, chariots hung with golden chains, and numerous cavalry and infantry soldiers. Bhishmaka, the lord of Vidarbha, came out of the city and met King Damagosha, offering him tokens of respect. Bhishmaka then settled Damagosha in a residence especially constructed for the occasion. Hmm. And um, there seems to be a typo in this copy of <laughs> Bhagavatam because verse 17 has no translation. Oh, Shishupal supported Shalva, Jarasandha, Dantavakra, and uh, Vidurata all came along with. Pondraka and thousands of other kings. All right, so this is our section. Omadhyana Timandasya Janandjana Shalakaya Chakshu Unmilitam Yena Jai. So uh, here we have the preparations uh, for a divine wedding. This is no Vegas wedding, as we can clearly hear. Um, there are intricate preparations, preparations that uh, testify to a very developed civilization. Mm. Uh, we can hear that uh, a lot of planning and preparation is going into this uh, this wedding that, that can only be described as as Hirios Gamos. Uh, so the, this ancient idea that um, the coming together of two people in marriage was something sacred and therefore all auspiciousness uh, was um, invoked. And uh, it's also telling, uh, listening to these descriptions exactly how attuned um, civilization was to the greater cosmos. We heard already earlier in this chapter that uh, Krishna could plan his abduction of Rukmini simply by uh, looking at the stars. In, in verse 4, we heard that his, um, his knowledge of riksham, of the stars, is enough to know exactly when this wedding is going to happen because of course if you are a civilized human being you will undertake action in accordance with the greater um, 
the greater universe, you could say. One of the, well, actually the first name of Lord Vishnu and the Vishnu Sahasranama is Vishwam, is universe. <laughs> uh, so there is this continuity. The will of the Lord is reflected in matter in this material world. Urdvarukam adashakam ashvatam prahuravyayam chandangsi yasya parnani yastang veda saveda vit. There is this imperishable banyan tree uh, in the 15th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes how ultimate reality is reflected in this material world, in the, into Prakriti. And uh, uh, there is something to be said for this higher order that um, comes uh, from, uh, from the stars. Uh, we had this mention here how the forefathers uh, was worshipped uh, in preparation of um, of this wedding, and of course, uh, foremost of those forefathers would be the seven sages. And uh, the seven sages, of course, um, are also associated with um, uh, the constellation of the Great Bear. Um, so there's this idea that this this harmony exists and to be in harmony with this higher reality uh, is in some way divine. Um, it's telling that at Krishna's birth we have the appearance of an astrologer. Can anyone remember his name? Kardamuni? Yes, <laughs> Kardamuni. And then uh, we have, of course, an astrologer at uh, Lord Chaitanya's birth, Nilambara Chakravarti. We have an astrologer at the Buddha's birth, the sage Asita. We have astrologers at Jesus' birth, well, four, <laughs> the, the four wise men, the, the so-called Magoi um, from Persia. So. There seems to be this motif um, that um, worldly power, if it is going to be legitimate and godly, has to be aligned in some way with this um, higher order. And, um, you know, of course, this is um, irresistible to me because um, I didn't choose this verse. <laughs> this, this section was given to me and uh, by its own accord, Yadrishaya, these uh, verses do speak of these brahmanas that were employed by King Bhishmaka and, of course, the father of Shishupala to create auspiciousness. And they were chanting verses to, um, to, pacify, uh, to pacify the planets. And uh, it's, uh, it's irresistible to me because I... I've been involved with Vedic astrology for a very long time, um, and uh, it is certainly a part of uh, of Vedic culture, supportive of a sattvic uh, lifestyle in in many ways. And the Bhagavatam itself is remarkably attuned to this knowledge. Uh, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur alludes to that in his um, commentary on the first verse of the Bhagavatam where he elaborates on how the first verse of the Bhagavatam is uh, expanding on the Gayatri Mantra, which is of course related to, uh, to the sun uh, in some ways. And he describes then how just like the sun travels through the 12 houses um, 12 astrological houses during the course of the year. In a similar way, um, the Bhagavatam gives us these different visions of Krishna through the 12 cantos of, of the Bhagavatam. And uh, there is a remarkable confluence between these ancient astrological ideas and the structure of the, the cantos of the Bhagavatam. So um, we have, for example, uh, the first canto that gives us uh, a little bit of the, the origin story, not only of Krishna, but of the Supreme in general. All the avatars are described. Uh, just like the first house in the astrological chart gives us a bit of an overview of a person. 
in uh, in the second um, we hear about the uh, resources um, the second house tells us about resources in the second canto we hear about the Vishwa Rupa if we go like that uh, through the cantos, the, the fourth canto um, uh, relates to Prithu Maharaj. Uh, well, we hear the pastimes of King Prithu, and Prithu is, of course, the lord of the earth, our home. And the fourth house in Vedic astrology relates to, well, your home, <laughs> to your lineage. Um, the, the fifth house relates to how um, we express our individuality. And one of the names of the fifth house in Vedic astrology is the so called Mantra Bhava. The house of mantras and you'll find in the fifth canto you have these wonderful vaishnava mantras to uh, different forms of vishnu that rule the different parts of uh, the universe there's the the famous uh, chant to lord narasimhadev um, um bhagavate narasimhaya namaste namas um, how does it go um namo bhagavate narasimhaya namaste tejas tejas say Avira Virbhava, Vajranaka, Vajradangstra, Karmasaya, Randaya, Randaya, Tamo Grasa, Grasa Om. It's like a very intense mantra to Lord Nisingadev in the fifth uh, in the fifth canto. The sixth canto, just like the sixth house in Vedic astrology that deals with hardship and difficulties. This is where we encounter Ajamil uh, and his pastimes. Um, uh, amongst others, uh, we also have uh, Vrita. Which was Sura in the sixth canto, devotees and their difficulties, <laughs> the sixth yeah. canto, and uh, uh, very similar to to the sixth house. The seventh house deals with one-to-one -one partnerships, and this is also the canto in the Bhagavatam where we have the most time spent on the one-to-one -one relationship between a devotee and the Lord. <laughs> it's like Lord uh, Lord Narasimhadev and Prahlad Maharaj. They that, uh, that uh, pastime is described in some depth. The eighth canto has, uh, just like the eighth house, is a bit of a troubling place uh, where our deep psychological transformation is seen. The eighth canto deals, of course, with the churning of the milk ocean, and, which very much reflects that, that inner churning. Um, the ninth uh, canto um, features, of course, the pastimes of Lord Ramachandra, and uh, the ninth house in uh, Vedic astrology would deal with Dharma. And so, of course, um, uh, our Lord Ramachandra is uh, the greatest example of Dharma, always doing things um, according to what is Dharmic, even if it's, if it's really, really difficult. And then we get to the tenth house, <laughs> or the tenth canto, and this would be... Um, especially the tenth house would be directly above one at the time of birth so it's the highest point in the chart it's the most exalted point and this is where we find the pastimes of lord krishna very elaborately described in great detail we're dealing with that right now um, just for the sake of completing <laughs> this look the 11th um, house deals with with gains. The 11th house and 11th chapters are, are very interesting. We also find this, of course, in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, because this is then where the universal form uh, makes its triumphant uh, appearance. But in the Bhagavatam, we really have the triumphant appearance of, of Bhakti Tattva. You'll find that so many of the verses describing the process of devotional service um, in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, in the Nectar of Devotion, come directly from the 11th canto. So you have this, this, uh, this overview of the Bhakti process in great depth, actually, in the 11th canto. And the 12th house deals with death and dying, <laughs> and how things ultimately dissolve. And then, of course, then in the 12th canto, we have the description of the age of Kali, and then also... Um, yeah, pralaya and maha pralaya, uh, cosmic destruction. So, so there is this theme. There, there is this um, continuity between um, uh, not only Vedic culture but, of course, um, uh, the Bhagavatam too. And it goes much deeper. We're just skimming the surface here. But keep in mind that Vyasadeva's father Parashara Muni was also a, a great astrologer. 
Parashara Muni's Ishta Deva was uh, actually uh, Lord uh, Narasimha Dev. And uh, in South India, there are uh, shrines to Lord Narasimha Dev where astrologers go to, <laughs> to pay their, uh, their homage. Um, and uh, a part of the poetic beauty of the Bhagavatam is exactly these astrological themes um, and how they are sometimes violated like uh, we find in, in this particular pastime too, because we have these, uh, they could only be highly qualified brahmanas. Don't tell me these brahmanas are not highly qualified. I mean, they are quintessentially Vedic brahmanas. They are the real deal, and they are chanting the real mantras at the right time. Uh, it's King Bhishmaka's camp, they are chanting. Um, Shishupal's camp, they are chanting. They are pacifying the planets like anything, <laughs> but somehow, as we know, um, this is not going to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Krishna has other plans, mm. and um, and nothing really can uh, stand in his way. Mm. So we find that um, uh, uh, Krishna is, of course, uh, Satya Sankalpa. He gets what he wants. <laughs> he doesn't have to, he can make rules, but he certainly doesn't have to obey them. Mm. And um, that is, that's very encouraging, I think, uh, especially if you've been involved with something like Vedic astrology for such a long time. It's, it's, it's really wonderful to know that, um, that Krishna can and does mm. violate this mm. cosmic order. Uh, although this, it's wonderful to have a Vedic civilization that runs in harmony with the cosmos. Um, it's certainly a much more conducive way um, of living one's life. At least it's much more conducive to, to developing a higher understanding. It's definitely much more conducive to a, a peaceful life. Um, but um, Krishna doesn't have to follow that. <laughs> he can he can do what he likes mm. and we get a taste here of Krishna not so much as um, the sagacious speaker of the of the Bhagavad Gita where he is completely equipoised and uh, I mean where is this equipoise right now like <laughs> where is his, 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 his concern for Shastra like of course you can make the claim is that description in Manu Samhita that um, uh, abduction is is a form of marriage yeah. it although it is a um, it would be an Asura Asuric marriage mm -hmm. that's how the Asuras get married Gandharvas just exchange garlands you know different rules for different folks <laughs> but uh, Krishna isn't exactly exemplifying uh, the, well, there is uh, there is the Kshatriya code, and um, the Kshatriyas to to show their strength are certainly allowed to um, to exhibit it in this way, because uh, abduction will clearly show your your prowess. Uh, so Krishna doesn't um, doesn't exactly have to to follow um, these codes. Um, yeah, um, when it comes to uh, this topic, of course, um, especially then of marriage, um, it's something that uh, that I personally deal with quite often. Although I've never been married, so you know I have to be careful, I guess, <laughs> like how far my um, expertise uh, really um, reaches. But um, it, there is something to be said for um, astrological compatibility. I, I do feel that is that that's worth mentioning that um, we are all uh, microcosms in a certain sense. That's very much the understanding uh, the Bhagavatam gives us, especially in in the portions describing the universal form that uh, uh, we have within us our own inner sun, that would be the buddhi, we have within us our own inner moon, that would be the mind. So the sun and moon are fully present within us, and uh, that interaction between the buddhi and the mind 
um, really makes up our personality. So this, this sun and moon sign at the time of birth reflects something of our uh, psychophysical nature. So if you do plan to embark on a long-term partnership with another person, it stands to reason that you, you would want to investigate how these things um, resonate uh, with one another. Is there confluence? Is, is there compatibility? It is really difficult at the best of times to, to make a partnership work, to make a relationship work. So in one sense, one may as well <laughs> lean into the wisdom of the sages and make the most of that and see if there are ways that they, um, they, can, they can benefit us. At the same time, if there is a higher purpose, and, then, and this is quite interesting, um, uh, over the years, something I've noticed that any relationship can work if you're willing to pay the price, you know, the, the price of a certain level of tolerance or discomfort, you know, any relationship can work if you're willing to pay the price. And if there is a shared higher purpose mm. to a partnership, mm. it can make it worth it, even if the astrology doesn't quite check out. <laughs> And uh, there certainly are uh, there are examples of that. At the same time, yeah, when it comes to world events, it does seem like um, we could uh, benefit from a little bit more uh, astrological education. Um, we recently had, of course, this major world transforming pandemic, and. Uh, it was very clearly scheduled in terms of um, uh, the Saturn-Uranus cycle. We also had this kind of conjunction in the early 80s uh, when we also had a pandemic that would be the HIV AIDS pandemic that had its start. And if we go back further to 1914, we had, of course, the Spanish flu. So you'll find that whenever these two grahas, as they're could be referred to in Sanskrit when they come together, uh, then uh, there are titanic changes in the world and in culture. And just to give you a heads up right now, it's going to happen again, <laughs> uh, 2034, 2035. So uh, we're heading, we'll likely have another pandemic and another um, world transforming uh, experience. So if you want to handle it with more grace, <laughs> then this last uh, yeah, episode, then maybe, um, yeah, it, it, it's worth, it's certainly worth taking note of that. And uh, uh, I, I wonder if, um, if we can maybe uh, uh, ask if there are questions at this time or if we have, um, still have some time. Should we open the floor to um, to the Vaishnavas? Okay. Yes, uh, so we have a question from uh, Hare Krishna. Well, <clears throat> Hare Krishna, not a, not so much a question but a reflection. You made a very important point. Vedas to Savar, Eva Vedu, Vedanta Grid Veda Vedeva Chaham, that the the Lord is the compiler of the system of rules. He's the knower of the Vedas, and he's the goal of the Vedas. So the lawgiver is free to uh, neglect the laws, right? And, and he's above the law. So that's a, that's a very super interesting point. And you can do all the rules and regulations, like Jesus criticized the um, smart of Brahmin, like... Um, Pharisees, Pharisees, right? He said, you have the letter of the law, but you've neglected the spirit of the law. What are you doing and who are you doing it for? You know, that pastime in the, the 10th canto about the, the Brahmins were performing sacrifices and then the coward boys came and said, um, Krishna's here and he's hungry, can we get some? And they said, no, no, we're doing a sacrifice, you know? And then, But the wives were wise enough to say, don't be ridiculous. You know, you may be doing all these things according to rules, but why and for who? 
you know, and here's Krishna. Give him the give him the ingredients. That's why we do these things. So this is a danger for us also. Krishna is so wonderful that he's pointing out the fact that we may forget why we're doing it, who we're doing it for, even if we're following so many rules and regulations. Oh, glory to Prabhupada. Prabhupada broke many rules. Even a simple example, he was giving class and the microphone was falling over and he said to one of the, his disciples, give me your sacred thread. What, my sacred thread? Take my, take my, take my Brahmin thread off? And he took the Brahmin thread and he tied up the microphone. You know, so this is, we're trying to preach here and whatever, well, utility is the principle, Prabhupada would say. You know, if this will put forward some improvement for Lord Chaitanya's mission, we do that. You know, there's so many silly things that devotees do, supposedly according to the rules. There's that pastime with these two devotees. One was after bathing, they were expecting Prabhupada to arrive here in New York. And he was putting on his socks. And the other devotee said, what are you putting socks on? You putting socks on? You know, like in the Bible, it says the, the, the burning bush, take your shoes off, this is holy ground. So the one putting on the socks said, he said shoes, he didn't say socks. And then they, they were coming in the temple on Henry Street, and there were so many devotees there, and they were right next to Prabhupada, and one, one devotee said, Prabhupada, there's so many devotees here. And Prabhupada, yes, satsang is very important. See, satsang is important. <laughs> you know, actually... We, and we're so silly that we don't really get the, what Prabhupada's saying. Brahm, Lord, Lord Buddha said, I'm pointing to the moon and my disciples are looking at my finger. Right? That we sometimes, we don't actually get it. So the point is, please, Krishna. If you get that, everything else falls into place. And if you forget that, even though these rules are helpful to bring us to the point of pleasing Krishna, we... We missed the mark. Okay, well, glory to Prabhupada. Talk me too long. Thank you, Adi Pusha. Thank you, Kali Karnapura, for a wonderful, elaborate class. Thank you. We have some hands raised. Um, Bhima Prabhu, Jeffrey Eckler Prabhu, who wants to go first? Uh, Mike had his hand up first. Mike, Mike Prabhu. Thank you so much for class, everyone. Thank you to Bhakti Center for hosting. Uh, I do have a question. I think this might be simple, but I thought you might be able to elaborate. Um, why Rukamini, not Radhe? You know? What? Why why, Ruk why did he marry uh, Rukamini and not Radhe? You know? I mean, if Radhe is his most beloved... Oh, I, I, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent question, Mike. So we don't have um, the days uh, needed to get into <laughs> to this particular uh, um, topic, but uh, briefly, um, and yeah, I'm going to try and be as yeah <laughs> diplomatic and. Uh, cordial as possible, because this is esoteric. This is now really getting to the inner workings of the Gaudiya Vaishnava understanding. Uh, there is, um, I, it, it really opens up many, <laughs> many vistas, Mike, but um, the, the love uh, mm. between uh, Radha and Krishna is something very confidential and uh, it, even the very etymology of gopi can be taken to mean she who hides something to keep something hidden so there is something to be said for uh, krishna's confidential dealings with the gopis and especially then um, uh, radha rani uh, the technical term for that approach would be parakya bhava Mm. The fact that um, that Krishna is not married, <laughs> that's exactly that makes it more uh, rasic in a certain way. It is not formal. It is not according to the rules at all. It, it um, challenges, 
it's above the rules it it, it subverts <laughs> on one level but it shows um a higher um a higher kind of attraction a higher kind of spontaneity um so yeah uh, krishna doesn't officially openly uh marry um radharani um i see here a, a, a comment popped up from a yogi let's see if i can retrieve it um yogi medium anush mentions that um yeah they are ekatma uh, god and the ideal devotee to worship radhas to worship krishna that is indeed true so uh the argument can be made, Mike, that uh, Krishna doesn't have to <laughs> marry Radharani because they are ekatma. They are they are one and the same. They're already one. Um, yeah, there, there's, there truly is a lot to unpack when it comes to uh, to this understanding. I, I hope that uh, that gives at least a a, a preliminary uh, answer to. <laughs> To, to where you could find an, a, a full answer. All right. Um, we have a question here from, I think, uh, from Bhima. Yeah, Bhima Prabhu, Jeff Reckler Prabhu, and Mukunda Prabhu, our scholar is here. Okay. Hey, Prabhu, you you them out. Gonna, we're going to conduct this Svayam, Svayam Vara forever. Let, um, let them all go first before me, if there's time. Just let them go. Haribo. Okay, Mukunda Prabhu, why don't you go? So, Dandavat Prabhuji, first, uh, Adi Purush Prabhu, I was in 1972 at Henry Street, and I think that was the first time I saw Srila Prabhupada, so I didn't know if your reference was to that time. It was a very wonderful time <laughs> for me. So that was very inspiring when you spoke about that. Um, um, but as far as the question that Prabhuji just asked, that in, in our Gaudiya theology, the height of love is love that does not have any bounds to it. In the marriage of Rukmini or Satyabhama Kalindi and other queens, Rupa Goswami has called this Samanjasa. Samanjasa means that the love has still some transcendental condition. This is my husband. There are certain duties. I will have 10 sons and one daughter. And so my love will be spread out somewhat. But among the gopis, and of course, especially Radhika, the love is exclusive to Sri Krishna. And it carries features that married life does not have. One is called Prachana Mukata. It has to be kept hidden. One is Dulabhata that it's very difficult to obtain each other's association. And also one other feature is that that love has a excitant and a feature that there is no duty uh, which requires Krishna to love the gopis. So the love itself is called samartarati. It's so pure that there's no condition. So especially when Krishna leaves on the chariot of Akrua, it's very amazing because the gopis cannot guarantee, even though Krishna says, yes, I will return day after tomorrow. But there's no guarantee because there's no legal connection why he has to return. So it just proves how high their love is. And he tells them, I'll end with this, he tells them, it means I cannot repay this kind of love. To all the queens, he reciprocates. I love you, you love me. But to the gopis, he said, I cannot even repay this kind of love. So this is the height of our Gaudiya theology, as Prabhuji mentioned. Thank you, Mukunda Prabhu. Okay, Jeff, Rekha Prabhu, and Bhima Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Good morning. Thank you for this class. Um, I had a question. Uh, as as uh, King Bishmaka is making these preparations, it says in the purport to the first verse you read in seven that he doesn't have any particular affinity for Shishupal, but he does it out of love for his son. Um, are, are we to understand in reading this that in any of our 
daily dealings that there may be collateral damage, so to speak, that w- that we may actually prepare nice things and nice arrangements for, quote unquote, the enemies of Krishna, um, because he does wind up preparing all of this for kings who are enemies of Krishna. Um, so that like in, in everything that we do, that we should do that by finding some place to do it out of love even though we may be fully aware that the enemies of God could benefit. Wow. <laughs> yeah, look, um, this material world is certainly a, a difficult space to navigate. And uh, sometimes what we take to be the enemies of God well, they're ultimately part of the cast yes. <laughs> that you know, um, that um, participate in in the drama of ultimately showing uh, Krishna Krishna's pastimes. Um, mm, there's a there's a, a line that I've been meditating on a lot from the Mahabharata. Uh, it comes from Vidura, where he says, uh, "Kala Pachati Bhutani." Um, very simple statement, but the time is cooking. Um, Pachati, all beings, is kind of so. Pachati is a verb with a whole range of meanings, but to ripen, to bring to perfection. So uh, at times, yeah, uh, our activities. Sometimes we even think it's our activities, but Krishna makes the point: um, anyone who thinks themselves the doer is an illusion. It's really the three modes. <laughs> that are acting and of course Krishna is um, he's orchestrating that he's the overseer of, of the three modes so yeah uh, there typically is a greater um, a greater scheme to things so yeah on one level it may be seen that uh, what when we try and be good we are benefiting the enemy but ultimately there uh, there are no enemies mm-hmm. i think we've got time for one more question Nima Prabhu. Or, or... i'll make it quick um the uh the uh, you began this class with uh the idea that there was a house uh cosm- cosmological house uh, devotees and their difficulties and i thought that rather apt for myself personally, um, I was reading um, uh, Bhagavatam Bhishma on his bed of arrows and Krishna coming to uh, see him. I have to make this very quick. Um, that in the purport, Prabhupada says that uh, even Krishna himself goes along with the uh, force of Kala, the force of time. Uh, Krishna allows himself to be swept along on this drama where even his dear most devotees, Arjun lost his son. Uh, Queen Kunti, this is uh, right after Queen Kunti's prayers. It, it's elaborated there, all the troubles that they went. You know, we're going to be put through these troubles, uh, whether we like it or not. Uh, as you said, Prabhu, in your lecture, uh, in your uh, lecture, and it's really nice to hear from this type of point of view. Um, uh, Jeez, I wrote it. <laughs> I actually wrote it down. The conch is going to blow. Hold on for a second. Um, you wrote down. This is a very good one because uh, it's something some people like myself uh, can always remember. Krishna has other plans. That's one. Th- that's all we have to repeat to ourselves. Uh, that if we just take care of our our um, you know calling out to Him uh, literally in this in this Kali Yuga, we're on an ocean. We've got one strand of hope that strand being the holy name and the association of devotees who throw us the holy name off the side of uh, the ship, the cruise ship going across America, the uh, the ocean of material suffering, and that we have to realize that there's going to be waves, we're going to take on salt, we're going to get thirsty, uh, this is all part of our uh, purification, and um, it is by our desire only how quickly we are saved. And that desire is manifest moment to moment, day to day. Um, and uh, thank you very much for, uh, you know, have such a wonderful um, uh, conversation with the devotees. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you.
whatever it says in your astrological chart, align it with Krishna and you'll be all right. Is that okay, Kavikarna Purna? Is that okay to say like that? Good. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Dear devotees, thank you for smiling. Krishnadaya Prabhu, you have the best smile in this call. The word goes to Krishnadaya and the best tilak. Yeah. Kavikarna Purna, any, any, Prabhu, any final uh, blessings for us on this Monday morning? Um, I just want to reiterate what Krishnadaya Prabhu mentioned here. Ultimately, there are no enemies. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Krishna. Krishnadaya Prabhu steals the show. <laughs> jai. Okay, Shrimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Kavikarna Purna, Prabhu Ki Jai. Get ready for the darshan, dear devotees. You will be seen by the Lord. How wonderful it is. Put on your best look. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes we don't see the forest for the trees. You know, we get lost in the rules and regulations and we forget who we're doing it for. Sometimes we forget Krishna and get lost. I was, um, I tried uh, doing my chart several times. <laughs> Every time they, they would say different things. And then finally I was like, you know what? Let me just keep my service going. Let me keep taking shelter of the devotees and I'll be all right. Because when you look at those planets, they are huge and you kind of freak out. Oh, this planet and that planet. Krishna overrides it all. He's he broke all the rules. Rukmini's marriage was perfectly arranged, and uh, Krishna overrode it like a bulldozer. So we can <laughs> jump on this bulldozer and we'll be fine. Okay. We just have to ask him to unmute because he had to come back in, so he got muted coming back in. Yeah, I don't think you can see it. Maybe we can chant that Lord Chaitanya on the farm <laughs> during the darshan. Did you send the cool... video to Bhima Prabhu? What's that? Did you send the video to Bhima Prabhu? Oh, yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> Bhima Prabhu, did you listen to the song? Lord Chaitanya on the farm. Hare Krishna. With a Hare Krishna there and a Hare Krishna there. <laughs> I, I, and then I do the whole mantra. <laughs> Great. Why not? Yeah. Krishna, he, he, must, he must be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, so there yeah. we go. Yeah. It says in, in the scripture, in every town, in every village, there will be Lord Chaitanya dancing in every on every farm. You can say. Okay, there's the link. Okay, Shishirana Murli or Kija. Shigura Chandra Kija.
Jai Jai Shri Shri Radha Mulidhar Ki Jai Shri Guru Chandra Ki Jai Gautam Ghosh, you're late again. Come one hour early. Okay, we change the clock. Go back one hour, Gautam Ghosh. Okay, we are wishing you a wonderful Monday. Suzanne, Sharmila, Ishwari, Sundari, Spirit Soul, Amrita Kishori, Sundar Nandaji, and family. Mukunda Prabhu. Wow, Mukunda Prabhu, what a scholar you are. Thank you so much for speaking today. Bhima Prabhu and Lord Chaitanya on the farm, having fun. Anandi and Donald, everyone, Gautam Ghosh, thank you very much. We love you. We need you on a daily basis. Come again tomorrow. Hare Krishna, Srimad Bhagavad.